now we will move into the third lecture that is called central limit theorem so this is a very important result in probability that is central limit theorem which has the wide application in many real world problems therefore this theorem will be used again and again in many problems so let me give the central limit theorem first then i give the proof then we will go for one or two examples of how to use the central limit theorem in the real world problems let me give the theorem first even though there are many versions over the central limit theorem first we will give the easiest version because it is a introduction to the probability theory and stochastic process course if the course is a advanced probability theory course then we can go for two three levels of a central limit theorem so here we will present only the simplest version of the central limit theorem whereas we will discuss how the complicated version in the central limit theorem after i give the proof of the simplest one so we'll give the simplest version of the central limit theorem let omega f capital p be a probability space let x1 x2 and so on be a sequence of iad random variables defined on omega f capital p assume that assume that expectation of xi that is equal to mu and variance of xi that is equal to sigma square which is greater than 0 for i is equal to 1 to exist that means we make sure that this sequence of random variables are iad as well as uh, at least a second order moment exist and the variance of uh, each random variable is greater than 0 since i made it iad random variable the sigma square is greater than 0 and also the finite quantity i am defining defining the new sequence of random variable i call it as a z suffix n that is nothing but sum of n random variables minus expectation of uh, these sum of random variables divided by square root of variance of uh, sum of these n random variables i am defining a sequence of random variable for n is equal to 1 2 and so on what the central limit theorem says then what the central limit theorem says then for larger n z n approximately standard normal distributed
random variable. Then for larger n, z n approximately standard a standard normal distributed random variable. That means that is the probability of z n less than or equal to small z approximately minus infinity to z 1 divided by square root of 2 pi e power minus t square by 2 t t. This is valid only for larger n that is very important and that too the C D F C D F for the random variable z approximately the integration from minus infinity to z 1 divided by square root of 2 pi e power minus t square by 2 dt that is nothing but uh, the C D F of standard normal distribution. this is valid as long as uh, x i s or uh, as long as x i s or i a d random variables defined on a probability space with at least the second order moment exist and the variance is strictly greater than 0 and then making a sum of random variables there my the minus their mean divided by the standard deviation that is approximately a standard normal distributed random variable for a larger n. Indirectly, indirectly, whenever you have a normal distribution with the parameters mu and the sigma square, by subtracting the mean divided by the standard deviation, that becomes a standard normal distribution. So, the same thing we are applying in the Zn the random variable is a sum of random variable that is a one random variable for fixed n minus their mean divided by the standard deviation that means uh, this uh, transformation is a transformation from normal distribution to the standard normal. That means uh, indirectly when we say when we say z n approximately a standard normal distributed random variable indirectly what we are saying the sum of n random variable approximately a normal distributed random variable with mean expectation of that random variable with the variance variance of sum of random variable for larger n. That is the meaning of a z n approximately a standard normal distributed random variable that is equivalent of a sum of random variable is approximately a normal distributed random variable with the mean is expectation of a sum of random variable and the variance is variance of sum of random variables. And here the assumptions are very important it should be IAD random variables with the at least the second order moment exist. Now, we will go for proof of this theorem. For the proof, uh, we will uh, make the assumption that uh, MGF of uh, each x i s exist, even though for some random variable MGF may not exist. And here we made the assumptions only at least second order moment exist. That does not mean that uh, MGF or moment generating function of each x i s exist. We make the additional assumption of uh, MGF exist then later we will relax the MGF exist then we can give the proof of it. So, without loss of generality we assume that uh, MGF of uh, x size exist for all the random variable because all are IID random variables. With that assumption we will give the proof later we can relax this also. Let us go for finding out uh, the MGF of uh, Z n as a function of t moment generating function for the random variable Z n as a function of t that is nothing but expectation of uh, 
இப்பவர் சம் ஆஃப் ரேண்டம் வேரியபிள்ஸ் ஒன் டு என் சின்ஸ் வி மேட் ஆல் ஆர் ஐஏடி ரேண்டம் வேரியபிள்ஸ் தேர் மீன் இஸ் கோயிங் டு பி மியூ என் டைம்ஸ் மியூ டிவைடட் பை வேரியன்ஸ் ஆஃப் சம் ஆஃப் ரேண்டம் வேரியபிள்ஸ் ஈச் ரேண்டம் வேரியபிள் வேரியன்ஸ் இஸ் சிக்னோ ஸ்கொயர் தேர் ஃபோர் சம் ஆஃப் ரேண்டம் வேரியபிள்ஸ் இஸ் என் சிக்னோ ஸ்கொயர் ஹியர் யூ நீட் ஸ்கொயர் ரூட் ஆஃப் வேரியன்ஸ் தேர் ஃபோர் ஸ்கொயர் ரூட் ஆஃப் என் சிக்னோ ஆஸ் அ ஃபங்க்ஷன் மல்டிப்ளைட் பை டி ஸோ திஸ் குவான்டிட்டி இஸ் கோயிங் டு பி த எம்ஜிஎஃப் ஆஃப் த ரேண்டம் வேரியபிள் ஜெட் this is possible as long as the mgf of uh, x i is exists therefore we made the assumptions mgf exist that is same as all the constant you can take it out therefore it is going to be ex- exponential of minus n times mu t divided by square root of n sigma multiplied by expectation of uh, e power 1 divided by square root of n sigma then the summation of x i is 1 is equal i is equal to 1 to n times t this is same as e power minus square root of n mu t divided by sigma you can use the expectation of e power summation of x i is t that is nothing but the all our iid random variable therefore you can go for expectation of e power 1 divided by square root of n sigma for one random variable x1 t after getting the expectation you can raise it to the power n because all are independent as well as identical that is same as e power minus square root of n mu times t by sigma this is nothing but a mgf of the random variable x1 instead of t you can write t divided by square root of n sigma both are on the same whether you write uh, mgf of uh, 1 divided by square root of n sigma x1 of t or mgf of x1 t is replaced by t divided by square root of n sigma both are on the same this power n because of identical now we need the expansion of mgf uh, for any random variable then we can substitute that we know that we know that mgf of any random variable x can be written as 1 plus mu t plus expectation of x square t square by 2 factorial and so on again you can write expectation of x square as variance of x suppose variance of x is sigma square plus mean square so one can write expectation of x square as a sigma square plus mu square i am going to substitute little later by taking a logarithm of mgf of xt i can use ln of 1 plus x as x minus x square by 2 plus x cube by 3 and so on provided mod x is less than 1 i can use this identity for the ln of mgf of x is ln of 1 plus mu t plus expectation of x square t square by 2 factorial and so on so i can make it as a ln of 1 plus all the other term i can make it as the sort of x mu t 
plus expectation of x square t square by 2 factorial and so on. This I can keep it as a 1 plus x form. So, I have not substituted ln of 1 plus x now, I am just writing L, ln of uh, the whole series as the 1 plus remaining terms as the x. Now, I am going to apply the same logic uh, for the MGF of z. That means, uh, now ln of MGF of the random variable z n of t that is going to be when you take a logarithm, it becomes a minus square root of n mu t by sigma. Then the remaining terms with the power, therefore, it becomes n, power n becomes n times ln of 1 plus mu. Here t is replaced by t by square root of uh, n sigma plus uh, expectation of x square is uh, sigma square plus mu square times uh, t square by 2 factorial n sigma square and so on. This is going to be minus square root of n mu t plus uh, sorry divided by sigma plus now I am going to apply ln of 1 plus x that is a n times it is a x minus x square by 2 plus x cube by 3. So, x is going to be this so the first terms in the x that is mu t divided by divided by square root of n sigma plus sigma square plus mu square t square divided by n sigma square 2 factorial is 2. I am not going to write other terms of x I leave it as it is. Whereas, now I am going to write minus x square by 2 terms that is minus 1 by 2 times in the x square also I am not going to write uh, x square of all the terms I am going to write the x square of uh, only first term that is uh, mu square t square by n sigma square all the other terms I leave it as it is there is a reason behind that I am not going to write uh, other terms of uh, x square. Similarly, I am not going to write any terms for the x cubes, only I write 1 by 3 all the other terms as it is. Like that uh, there are some more terms, some more terms uh, for the expansion of ln of 1 plus x, this is going to be close bracket. The reason is as n tends to infinity, even though I use the word for larger n, here we are going for as n tends to infinity. The n in the numerator and many terms in the n in the denominator that cancelled and all the other terms will be in the form of 1 divided by n. Not only that, this one and this one cancel, whereas the sigma square plus uh, mu square t square this one with the first term here that cancels. So, the left out is uh, sigma square t square divided by 2 n sigma square that will be cancelled with n in the numerator. So, you will have a uh, only sigma square t square by 2 sigma square, sigma square also cancels. So, you will left out with t square by 2 even though we have many more terms as n tends to infinity all the other terms will vanish. So, you will have a 
as n tends to infinity l n of m g f of z n is going to be t square by 2. All the other term vanishes as n tends to infinity. Now, I am taking exponential both side that means m g f of z n that is going to be e power t square by 2. If you recall the moment generating function for the standard distributions we have discussed for many uh, discrete uh, type random variables. Similarly, we have discussed uh, continuous type random variables MGF. So, if you compare the MGF of this with the MGF of a standard distribution, you can conclude uh, you can conclude by using the uniqueness theorem of uh, two different MGFs are same for all t then both the random variables are identically distributed. So, you can conclude Z n is standard normal distribution. So, this is valid for n tends to infinity. That means, for a larger n the Z n approximately a standard normal distribution that is a proof. In this proof we have made assumption of m g f exist. Now, we can see what could be the proof or how the proof goes when we do not have a assumption of m g f. The similar derivation I can go for characteristic function. So, the characteristic function of z n of t that is going to be expectation of e power the whole expression t where t is replaced by i times t where i is square root of minus 1. For that I do not need any assumption because the characteristic function exists for all the random variables. Therefore, the characteristic function for z n exists. So, I can directly compute the characteristic function of z n. In this result wherever the t I have to replace by i times t that is going to be the derivation of characteristic function by a. So, if I do the same derivation everything goes in the same fashion because I keep i a d random variables mean is mu variance is sigma square and so on. Therefore, wherever there is a t it will be replaced by i times t. So, that will be cancelled wherever there is a t square that is going to be minus t square because it is going to be i square t square i square is minus 1. After you do the simplification till the as n tends to infinity, you will get the answer minus t square by 2 for the L n of characteristic function of z n. That means, uh, the characteristic function of z n is going to be e power minus t square by 2. That is the result for the characteristic function for standard normal distribution. Then we can conclude uh, also z n is approximately a standard normal distribution. So, whether we made the assumption m g f or not the derivation is almost similar way to conclude it is approximately a standard normal distribution. I said I am going to discuss the little higher versions of the central limit theorem. <coughs> yes, see the theorem carefully I have made a i a d random variable. Suppose if it is a not identically distributed, then you can find what are all the changes. That means, uh, if each x i is are uh, not uh, identically distributed, then their mean will be mu i's, variance will be sigma i squares. That means, uh, each one may have a different means. Still, you can apply the theorem because z n is going to be sum of random variable minus their mean. So, whatever the mean mu i s you add all the mu i s find out the summation of mu i s that is going to be the expectation. In this theorem when they are identical it becomes n times mu if they are not identical then it becomes mu 1 plus mu 2 plus so on mu 1. Similarly, the denominator here it is a square root of uh, square root of n sigma, but if they are not identical then you will have a <coughs> sigma 
point square plus sigma 2 square and so on square root of that. Still the derivation goes, but we cannot apply the power n, we cannot apply the power n the way we have done it here because of identical we got power n. So, when you go for derivation for non identical distributed random variable you have a individual MGF in the product form. So, when you take a logarithm and so on the expression will be huge, the process of a derivation may be tedious, but still as I intense to infinity you can conclude the same result. The derivation may be very complicated when they are non identical distributed. Still we can go for it the same derivation. One more observation here we have used the independent random variable in finding the square root of variance of sum of random variables. Since uh, all the random variables are independent, the variance of sum of random variable is uh, nothing but the individual uh, variance summation. If they are not independent, then uh, you have to go for uh, adding the covariance of uh, any two random variables. So, since we made the assumptions they are independent random variable, we are finding the individual variance, then we are sum it up that is going to be the variance of sum of random variables. Otherwise, you have to use the covariance of any two random variables. That means, uh, we can relax instead of uh, they are independent random variable, you can make the assumptions uh, all the random variables covariance of any two random variables is 0, that is enough you do not need a independent assumption, independent is the strongest assumption comparing to the covariance of any two random variables are going to be 0, because the covariance of any two random variables 0 that does not imply they are independent, but if two random variables are of some random variables are mutually independent, then the covariance of any two random variables are going to be 0. So, here in this theorem I made a strongest condition therefore, this is the simplest version of central limit theorem, whereas uh, we can go for covariance of any two random variables are 0 that is enough to use the central limit theorem. One more observation over the central limit theorem, why this is uh, used in many situations. You see the theorem very carefully, we have not used uh, any distribution for random variables x size and we have used only the mean and variance of random variables and assumption of independent nothing else. Because of that this theorem is used in many real world problems that means many real world problems many random variables which we have created those random variables we may not know the distribution of that we may not know the distribution of those random variables, but uh, we may know the mean and variance uh, as a numbers, we may know mean and variance of those random variables, even they are uh, dependent or the dependency may be very very minimal or uh, we can ignore the dependency or we can make the usage of uh, those random variables are independent or in the lighter sense we can use the concept of uh, covariance of those two random variables are 0, with that assumption you can use this theorem. So, the big advantage of uh, this theorem is uh, there is no assumption over the distributions or you do not need the distribution of each x size, we need only the mean and variance. Therefore, we can use uh, this theorem to find out the probability of event using a standard normal distribution by approximating this random variable as a standard normal distribution. That means, uh, whatever be the distribution of those random variables, once you sum it up by subtracting their mean divided by the standard deviation for larger n, we can always approximate immaterial of whether it is a discrete type random variable or continuous type random variable, as long as they are independent random variable that can be approximated with a normal distribution by normalizing, it can be approximated with a standard normal distribution. Therefore, we use this theorem 
quite a lot in many real world problems. Now let us go for a few examples how one can use the central limit theorem. 